much for coming. Um, in, in half an hour, it's really impossible to talk about everything about outside broadcast. So this is based on the anniversary theme. And we'll start with another anniversary uh, that occurred recently. And I'm just pressing this. I said stop. Yes, here we are. There is sound on this. If we plug the sound in. Yeah, it sounds yeah. in. It should be there. This is the BBC television station at Alexandra Palace. With those words, 70 years ago to this precise minute, Leslie Mitchell officially opened the world's first high-definition television service, broadcasting a regular schedule of programmes directly into people's homes. In other words, it was the beginning of television as we know it today. And we welcome, first of all, with a song of particular significance, Miss Adele Dixon. Now, of course, you could say, what's all that got to do with outside broadcasts? Um, uh, it's where television, of course, started. And that particular piece was from the 70th anniversary of Alexandra Palace programme that was put together by the Test Card Circle. Um, and uh, that guy who introduced was uh, one of the, the committee from, from the Test Card Circle. Um, but it wasn't long before somebody said, OK, we can do it in the studio, but hit the road, Jack take it out, where can we put our cameras, how can we get our cameras to go outside? And some of those shots show the, the, the sheer bulk and mass of the, of the equipment that was in use at that time. How to put that on the road? Um, that was the, the next problem. So we started with We've got two of our cameras high up on the gate itself, one looking up the East Carriage Drive. Uh, this will catch the procession as it comes into view, and the other that will take the tail of the procession after it's passed by us. The third one on the pavement is within some three or more feet of the royal coach as it comes by. This is the one that will have the honor of televising their majesties for the first time. Uh, this will give you some idea of what we look like from the ground. Last preparations, a last look round the camera on the pavement to see that everything's all right. And now, I'm sorry to say that conditions are against us. It started to rain, and the light is none too good. 
but we'll stick to it and hope for the best. Very bad luck, as had it been an hour ago, everything would have been first. Everton Greys drawing on that almost unbelievable state coach with their majesties, the king and queen. Um, just some of the problems that outside broadcast always has. It always rains at the wrong time. There's always people in front of your camera when you don't want, especially when the public are involved. You always have to do a, a lot of planning about where you're going to put things. Um, it's made even more critical these days by, by health and safety. Um, but the, that with the camera side of it, this is the truck that they used. Notice it's got labelled Marconi EMI uh, because it was very much a partnership at that time. Um, they didn't have very much cable in those days, so the cameras couldn't be very far from the truck. And there's <coughs> the side all opens up for maintenance. And this was just enough to run three cameras in, in those days, miniaturized form. Now, the interest about that, that's inside of the, the camera control vehicle, all standing up, but facing the sides of the vehicle. For many years, outside broadcast trucks always worked with the operators facing either the front or the rear. Um, and it wasn't until really color that vehicles started changing and, and going back to operators facing the sides of the vehicle. It's one of those little quirks about sort of outside broadcast <coughs> concept. But, um, there was no other way for them to do it in this instance. Now they always had to, that's a picture of the further down the vehicle, you can see the two monitors at the end, which was effectively their transmission and preview monitors. novel means of handling the cable, even in those days they rec did recognise the fact that cable was a problem. You know those stickers you get to put on the back of your car, you know golfers do it with balls, but well, we have one that sort of, we need one that says OBers do it with cable. Cable is a very significant factor in any sort of outside broadcast, the handling of it, storage of it, it's never quite long enough. Uh, that's the interior of the transmitter vehicle, which was the Marconi part particularly. The camera part was done by EMI. And this is the, uh, the generator truck. But they always had to take their own power. There was no way they could get enough power to run uh, a unit like this from, from street mains. <coughs> That's a site layout for that outside broadcast. And we, can, we can see here that uh, well, the, the, the cameras were, were quite close. It just reinforced. I'll just keep, just keep going. Um, you can see the camera site, the camera site is all quite close together, it's time down there. Ah. Now, one of the problems about outside broadcast is you need to get the signal back to the transmitter, and uh, to, to your to broadcast transmitter. This was the, then the coaxial cable network that was installed uh, to, to, to get cables, to signals originally from the centre of London back to Alexander Palace. Uh, the cable equaliser there to get signals. It's a problem we have here, just trying to get signals from the truck into this room. We, we unfortunately left the cable equaliser at home, so the signals aren't quite as good as they, they should be. But they could also do it with a local transmitter truck. Note that rather strange aerial configuration on the top. So that was the remote transmitter truck. Meanwhile, the coaxial cable is being tested by the post office engineers. This coaxial cable is destined to carry television from the heart of London up to the transmitter. The 
electric cable is hauled through ducts at Alexandra Palace. And greased to make it slide more easily down the manholes and through the pipes which carry it. Length by length, it is pulled through. Right from the start, there were two systems that, in, that could be used for getting the signal back, either the cable network um, or, or the, uh, the, the radio transmission from, from, from those separate vehicles. Um, that's a, a map showing the route of the original London coaxial cable network. So things moved on a little bit, and this was the first Wimbledon. Wimbledon's always been an important feature in the OB calendar. Um, this year, I'm reliably informed, is the first year that Wimbledon is totally going to be HD. There's no standard definition at all. It starts fitting up next week for this year's Wimbledon. That is. <clears throat> Don't need a lot of cable when your camera's stood on the roof of the truck. But they were awfully big and heavy and, and more or less handmade those cables at that time. The other aspect of television which brings home its exciting actuality and immediacy is the outside broadcast. This is only a film, but our actual broadcasts are live. We take you to the event, and nobody in the world knows who will win or what will happen. You see it yourself, and thus share in the excitement of those who are actually present. Like the studio camera, the outside broadcast camera is connected directly to its own control room, but in this case a mobile one, which is the counterpart of the studio control room at Alexander Palace. Now, hold it, Miss. On new camera one. A specialist commentator, who in this case would be a rowing man, adds to your and our enjoyment with an expert description of the event. Show you the plan to stop it now. Hobson's wife, Hobson's wife, it's all out of our shabby. But there it is. Hobson's wife is here, gentlemen, by a clear length and a half. Welcome to the boathouse. To join a crowd which is displaying very mixed feelings, and those disappointed faces leave no doubt that their owners were supporting Cambridge. The link with the main transmitter can be either by means of a special high frequency cable, which can be tapped almost anywhere in the west end of London, or when the outside broadcast unit is not on the cable route, by means of a mobile transmitter, the signals of which are fed to a transmitting aerial mounted on an extendable fire escape. The wavelength used is shorter than that of the main transmitter at Alexandra Palace, so the outside broadcast signal can be picked up either at the palace itself or at a convenient receiving station on the cable route, whence it is relayed by the cable to the palace. Here it is re-radiated from the main area. Viewers who were able to look in on Thursday will have seen the opening events of the Olympic Games. For the evening transmission, the BBC brought into use for the first time its latest EMI outside broadcast equipment. The new vehicle arrived a few days ago at Wembley, and the head of television outside broadcast is here to tell you about it. Well, it's no secret that outside broadcasting has in the past been carried out under great difficulty and with very cumbersome equipment. And this compact trailer contains the fruits of many years of planning. This is one of the new CPS Emitron cameras being handled for the first time. It's extremely sensitive, and can produce good pictures in light far too dim for cine cameras. On the roof is an ordinary television aerial used for picking up the picture as rebroadcast from Alexandra Palace. This enables the producer to make a smooth changeover from the studio to the OB program. Doors in the side lead into the trailer, which is itself a mobile control room. The equipment can actually be taken out of the trailer, if required, for use elsewhere. Inside the vehicle, everybody sits in comfort instead of standing, as we had to in the old vans. 
Each of the three cameras has its own preview tube, so that the producer can instantaneously select for transmission the best of the three pictures available. Here at the Empire Pool are the cameras themselves set up ready to watch first the aquatic events and later the boxing. The cameras are extremely complicated and use miniature valves developed for radar and other secret purposes during the war. The viewfinder is itself a small television tube instead of the optical finder that's used in the older cameras and all the components are easily accessible for maintenance purposes. Another useful feature is the revolving lens turret, operated from behind, and by which any of these three lenses can be brought instantly into position. The largest of these is the 17-inch telephoto to give you close-ups of distant events. The whole turret can be removed in a matter of seconds and replaced with another. This one carries three wide-angle lenses to give wider fields of view. So, beginning with the Olympic Games of 1948, television outside broadcast enter on a new era of comfort for their crews and, we hope, even better pictures for you. But it didn't stop there. They carried on developing things. And it wasn't long before other manufacturers came into, into play. They got away from the Marconi EMI now and started into Pi. The old Palace of Arts at Wembley is now the technical base of the television outside broadcast department. And the policy of re-equipping it with the most modern apparatus was continued when this van was delivered there the other day. Designed and made by the Pi Radio Company to BBC specifications, the equipment was... There's this note on the side of the van there. It's, it's, I should have told you before the picture went past, but the BBC always had a, a numbering system and their control rooms were, were called MCR for mobile control room um, with, with then a number afterwards. And they were always allocated sequentially. As they built a new unit, then they gave it the next number in the sequence. And you can actually see the number on the side of that vehicle. as it ...used operationally for the first time on Wednesday when the finals of anti-aircraft command boxing championships were broadcast from the Albert Hall. Rapid change from long shot to close-up is possible through the rotating lens turret controlled from behind. Four lenses can be brought into use in turn. Thus the quest for better quality pictures goes on, so that British television may remain one of the most advanced systems in the world. Two guys to carry the camera, look. <laughs> Definitely had the health and safety. Wembley, where television's outside broadcast department puts a new camera unit through its tests. Its main feature is that the camera can largely be operated from inside this mobile control van by remote control. It only needs a push on the button at the main switchboard to set the camera into action. The turret can be revolved, the camera focused, all without anybody touching it. In fact, it's a step towards doing away with the cameraman. But that's only likely to happen when the space is so restricted that there's no room for him. the design is new, the camera will give much the same picture as all other outside broadcast cameras now in use. Made in Cambridge, it will go into action for the first time later tonight, Wednesday, at the snooker tournament at Leicester Square Hall. Watch out for that Wednesday, be there. <laughs> Countless millions of people, both at home and abroad, will be sitting down to watch the historic... Notice the GPO, that the vehicle there is a GPO Lynx vehicle, it's a line uh, equalising unit. Um, uh, people who may remember uh, Andy Emerson, um, he owned one of those for a short period of time that he was hoping to, to restore, but unfortunately it, it sort of the, the amount of work and the, and the cost defeated him and he passed it on to somebody else. But uh, that appears in a couple of other pictures later. ...historic event on television. 
The BBC's television outside broadcast facilities, including a score of cameras, have been concentrated in London. And here is one of the BBC's television control rooms, the one which has been set up at Westminster Abbey. From here, the five television cameras inside the Abbey will be coordinated. Broadcasting House is the main television control room. Here, monitor screens enable pictures to be selected from points all along the route. At the same time as pictures are seen in millions of British homes, viewers on the continent will also watch the ceremony. Um, an interesting little whoops, point there that um, you notice there's lots of gear all stacked up, and even though they were doing outside broadcasts based on vehicles, the BBC still liked this concept of what they call D-Rig, which was carrying all the gear into the venue, wiring it all up, and then carrying it all out again. And right up until the, um, the Type 2 colour scanner, they still expected to be able to do D-Rigs. In fact, that if you watch um, uh, Steve Harris's really nice film about the Type 2 um, scanner, which he's hoping to, to restore, that was built so that they could take all the equipment from, from a, a six camera colour unit out of the vehicle, wire it up on site and then put it back in the vehicle. They did do it once to prove that, to show that it could be done and it was such hard work and it took so long to make the whole vehicle work again after they put it all back that they never ever did it. And, uh, from, from that time on the, the, sort of the requirement for D-Rig has, has sort of disappeared although there were still big piles of equipment set up for uh, specifically for them. mind the southern independent TV truck outside, this in fact was southern's very first truck ever uh, as a mobile, really weird looking thing, and, uh, but they were trying to beat the weather of course, the idea was that they could have a camera up in that top bit um, and not get wet, <laughs> but uh, whether it actually worked or not I don't know. This is rather novel, I'd never seen this until very recently, I, I, you might enjoy this bit, there's some lovely health and safety moments. No two outside broadcasts are ever the same. Some may need lighting, and that might mean more vehicles. A control van, full of its delicate apparatus, has to shudder its way over miles and miles of rough roads. Even the most insensitive member of the team couldn't expect everything to work at the first throw of a switch. We've reached the site of our OB. Unloading begins, strictly to the book. The last thing on is the first thing off. The scaffolding is go going up. The cables are coming in. Cables for cameras, cables for microphones, maybe for telephones. Not necessarily trunk lines, but still they get confused with elephants. Cables fed out as expertly as firemen unreeling their hoses. The shortest way between point A and point B is a straight line. That's the ideal, but it's not always possible. Somewhere is one end which connects to a camera. Somewhere another end to be fixed to the control van. In between there may be joins, and joins must be watertight. Everything's now ready for the cameras. The ground has been prepared for them, and like the principal guests at the party, they are escorted carefully in. Getting it to work is the job of the senior racks man. As well as his expert knowledge of electronics, it's essential that he's familiar with the whole of the inside of this van. He lives with it. He knows every valve, every connection. With this knowledge goes a sense of ownership. If rough roads jolt the equipment, they hurt the racksman as well. We've seen the equipment 
the cameras and the control van arrive. Here comes another part of the convoy, the so-called link van. To the outsider, it's probably the most impressive of the lot. The Eagle Tower is the big transportable mast used to beam the outside broadcast signal. The tower may have to withstand the buffeting of high winds, so firm ground and careful erection are essential. The aerial dish is manhandled to the top of the tower. The tower will go up to a height of about 60 feet. The dish is like a concave mirror. It focuses the narrow three-degree beam in a line of sight with the receiving dish. The mobile video tape van is one of the more recent additions to the outside broadcast fleet. It carries its own videotape recording machine and has the advantage over the other van of being more mobile. Pictures can be taken on the move, its one camera being supplied with power from the generator it tows. An awareness of these sort of requirements is all part of the job. It's long, physically tiring, and tedious work. It's thirsty work, too. You know, I said earlier about the, the, the GPO units, of the <coughs> post office very often provided lines, even if they didn't handle video, they still had communication lines uh, to site so that the OB could talk to back to the studio. Um, sometimes they would send the sound that way so that if the microwave link failed, then at least they could do the con this program continues in sound only, and it was a separate route. But I've just read quite an interesting little book for, from uh, a guy that was worked for the uh, post office and BT for many years called Between the Lines. Uh, and he tells a story of, of uh, uh, they were asked to go and set up some lines for uh, the Queen's speech, which he was doing from Sandringham. And they got well underway with, with the speech. And then all of a sudden, the, the operator from the local exchange plugged in and said, that this line seems to have been busy for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Do, is the caller aware of the cost? <laughs> We're getting a little bit more modern now. Hundred is proving to be exceptionally reliable, and there is the further reassurance that it was designed and constructed by the. Uh, this is EMI. Um, those of you who know me know that I've, I've worked for EMI, but not the television section. Um, but the other thing about it, this is a, a, a trial of, of telecameras were by TWW, Television Wales in the West, which was the Bristol and Cardiff uh, franchise holder at the beginning of independent television. And the particular piece that's on the end of this, where they're actually trialling a camera, was done at the Bath and West uh, Agricultural Showground, um, which is just up the road from where I live. A firm that has been the leader of electronic research since the early 30s. The cameras for the world's first high-definition television service were invented and made in our factory at Hayes. Today, we are still leading the research in the latest television development, colour television. Studio tests are now wholly successful, and many uses for closed-circuit colour television have been found. The colour rendering has been accurate enough for surgical demonstrations. When a natural colour television service is wanted, the equipment will be ready. This is the showground. legendary EMI 204 with twin um, uh, Mark IV-B camera cables. Uh, this is a, an, an odd picture. Nobody quite knows uh, if anyone can recognise this. It's uh, an EMI truck. Um, fairly late in the black and white era, but, but we don't know who <coughs> it was. Uh, these are some pictures of people you might recognise. 
Marconi cameras. Fifteen tons of artificial snow. Took the council two weeks to clear it up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and all the vehicles that come in, brought in for the for the job, they're all set dressing, provided by various uh, film prop suppliers. Cars feature quite significantly in, in this program, uh, generally. So we have a lot of cars. lettering the truck at the last minute and it still still has those labels now. That's a hired truck, it was made to look like a camera tender for the OB later on. More now. <laughs> Yorkshire Chine Trees truck, of course, was at the last BATC at Shuttleworth. Some familiar faces. Part of the clean up the snow. Um, I've got the program excerpt. I don't know whether we've got time for it, have we? It's uh, about two and a half minutes. Right here. Okay, here we go. if you ask me. Yes. Sorry, can you move? I can't have anyone parking there. Excuse me. I need that space for our presenter. I said I need that space for our presenter. My word. Are these the people from the television? Yes. Hmm. Straw. Mr. Lamar's very fussy about his parking space. Quite extraordinary. Could you move these things, please? I'm trying to get my patient back to bed. Okay, George, lights this end. <laughs> and just a little bit back to where we started. Uh, this is that same truck outside Alexandra Palace to provide the broadcast facilities for the Alexandra Palace uh, 70th uh, anniversary. Um, I need to do a, some acknowledgements. All the still pictures in that royal sequence were, were from Dave Hill. Um, quite a lot of the, um, the vintage stuff was, was given to me by you know, a guy called Norman Green, who's uh, ex-IBA. Some of it's things I've found. Um, 
and that's it really. Thank you very much for your time.